Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Goa, General Partner at Greylock. You're listening to Grey Matter, where we share stories from company builders and business leaders. This is part of our Work From Anywhere series, exploring how we in the business world are adjusting to the global pandemic. Today's special episode features economics and management professor at Stanford, Nicholas Bloom, whom I so enjoy talking to because he's just a goldmine of data-based insight. And he's that weird guy who's been thinking about and studying distributed work for more than a decade, back when it was fringe, and who's of course been closely tracking office reopening plans. Let's talk about the future of hybrid. Nick, super excited to have you on the podcast. Would you mind introducing for our listeners uh, yourself and a little bit about what your research areas are? I'm Nick Bloom. I'm a professor of economics at Stanford University in California. Uh, You can probably hear I'm British, hopefully. I've been in the US for 15 years. I've long worked on management practices in part spurred by working at McKinsey a long time ago. And for a long time, actually interested in this weird niche called working from home which was like of complete boredom to anyone until suddenly you can imagine March 2020, it became like the hottest topic around. So I'm now spending most of my time working on that, talking to execs, collecting data, et cetera. It's been incredibly interesting as we keep an ear to the ground with our portfolio and the leaders in in the startups in our ecosystem. But what are you hearing as people make these decisions about how to come back into the office and not? What are you predicting firms will do? I'll just give you a background. I've been serving thousands of firms and individuals, also talking to a lot of, I've been doing a lot of consulting. So most firms have decided, I would say something like two thirds by now have, have opted for hybrid. Within tech, that's an even higher share. So tech has gone heavily for hybrid. So here the setup is, you say we're going to come into work, let's say Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, work from home, Wednesday, Friday. So, for example, Google just announced, you know, exactly this, the three, two plan. So three days a week in the office for most people to at home. So that's by far the most common. There are, there are some people that, you know, but more in like investment banking, for example, have said we hate hybrid. You've got to come back in. There's good reasons for some of these firms to say that. For example, if you're trading, you need high speed connections. Or you, you're dealing in confidential data. There are other firms that have said we love remote, like Cora would basically going to stay remote almost permanently. But I would say the vast majority are are saying hybrid. And then there's a whole range of debates about how you make that work at the basic level. You know, most firms are all remote now, but they are going to get people back into the office for the majority of days, but definitely not all of them. That's also similar to what we're hearing, that most workplaces, especially in technology, we should talk about the industry variation as well, are going to be hybrid. What do you think is going to be hard about that? What are leaders worried about or what what are the issues people are asking you about? So I should first say why hybrid. So hybrid, you know, I've been advocating this since literally the lockdown. I wrote a blog piece in May 2020. And many tech firms, tech has been really advanced on this. So, for example, Mark Zuckerberg made a statement last May as well. So to me, hybrid seems pretty obviously the way forward. And the reason is it's a nice trade-off between two challenges. So you get a big advantage in person on A, innovation and B, culture. So you know, just about every manager I speak to says, you know, you really want face to face meetings to be creative and innovative and it builds bonds and builds culture. So you want, you know, a few days a week on that. But there's also a big upside from working from home, which is A, you save the commute, which is a lot of time. The average American spends an hour a day commuting and B, for work that's actually individual or maybe like one on one, like we're talking now, it's fine. It's maybe even better remote. So certainly if I'm reading a report of working is quieter at home than in the office. And so hybrid's kind of the best of both worlds if you organize it properly. So what that means is within a team, with, around people you work with, you make sure you're all in on the same day. So you quite literally, the team manager says, everyone's going to come in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. And that way, all uh, the team lunches, training events, leaving dues, client things, and you know, anything that were big meetings are on those three days. The other two days, Wednesday, Friday, say, you know, those are my days to do my quiet reading, et cetera. So at that level, that works pretty well. There's a big debate around choice. That's basically why hybrid is the overwhelming majority because it trades off two tensions around we need some face-to-face, we need some home time, and it's kind of the sweet spot. And for all firms, three days a week may not be right for all firms. It may be four, it may be two, but it's somewhere in the middle. It's roughly 50-50. I've been doing exec ed at Stanford on this and talking to a lot of firms. So I'll tell you the choice issue. So the choice issue, and I've even changed my own mind since the beginning of the pandemic. So here's the choice issue. The choice issue, if you look in the survey data, 
you see very clearly there's a huge variety of preferences over how many days people want to work from home. So, for example, I think it's 27% of people basically say they never want to work from home ever again post-pandemic. They're fed up with it. It's boring. It's isolating. It's terrible. They tend to be younger single people or empty nesters. Then there's a bit over 30% that actually say the exact reverse. They say, we love working from home. We want to carry on working from home five days a week. They tend to be, you know, kind of late middle-aged or middle-aged married with kids. Yeah, I guess like me and living in a house. And then the majority, which I should say would include myself, want to come in something like one, two, three, four days a week. So you think on the one hand, like we should let people choose. You know, this is America. We like freedom of views and it's going to make the employees happy. And I've heard many execs, particularly in tech, actually say that. There are two problems, one obvious, one less obvious. The obvious one is the mixed, you know, what I'll call the curse of mixed mode. So mixed mode is when, you know, there's five of us on a call, three in the office, two at home. You have the three in the office, you're all in some little conference room, two at home on separate screens. It's like it's not an equal thing. You know, you can see three tiny heads. So when you talk to managers, say, aha, we've got a solution to that. We're going to do what I call, you know, the American in Germany example, which is as an American, when you go to Germany, if you're out for dinner with four Germans, they all speak English because, you know, (laughs) they just like humor you and speak English. They're similar that if there's just one person at home, Everyone in the office has to connect in on their on their laptop so that they're all on an equal footing. Fine, but there's a problem with that, as you can see, which is, of course, once the meeting's over, everyone in the, la- in the office stands up, grabs a coffee, and the meeting effectively continues. So mixed mode is still somewhat problematic. The much worse thing is what I'll call diversity, which is if you look in the survey data, what we see, for example, amongst college-educated respondents to our surveys, which is about 60% of the labor force, if you look at people with kids 12 or under, women report almost 50% higher share of them want to work from home five days a week than men. We also see people living further from the office, disabled people. There are certain groups that are clearly have a stronger preference for working from home more days than others. So that's fact one. You know, that kind of is what it is. And then the other fact is from years of research, we know that if you're in a team whereby some people are coming in every day, and others are working from home, those working from home face a big promotion penalty. So, for example, I did a large randomized control trial out in China several years ago where we randomized volunteers into working from home. And those that were randomized into working from home for four days a week, their promotion rates were half those in the office after 21 months. So that's an enormous difference. Now, otherwise identical, they've been initially randomized. So if you put that together, you can see there's a huge risk with the choice plan that five or 10 years from now, you have, you know, all the single young men coming in five days a week, rocketing up the company. And let's say, you know, people who married with young kids, particularly women, choose not to and then just don't get promoted. And I think that's pretty difficult to deal with. So I'll pause, but that is a hugely contentious issue of where firms are deciding on choice individually, choice at the team level or no choice at all. We're thinking a lot about the sort of second class citizen problem is how we're referring to it internally at Greylock. And I think one thing that you and I were discussing was like, is it too ambitious to think that we can actually solve some of these problems if we, to some degree, constrict the choices to put people on an equal playing field and then improve the, you know, the tools and processes for hybrid teams? In China, years ago, I had a graduate student called James Liang, who's now the CEO of Trip.com. And so he did a big randomized control trial on his firm and we randomized hundreds of people. It was, you know, huge scientific experiment. You only get that if the CEO is, you know, a PhD student. It was an amazing setup. But so he did lots of interviews. Super cool, yeah. It was really great. And James is a fantastic guy. And, you know, I know probably, you know, a b- bunch of venture firms have invested in James's firm and I think done very well over the years. So we actually interviewed and tried to find out why do people that work from home not get promoted as fast? And I've talked to a lot of, friends and colleagues and firms. So I think there are two reasons. One is fixable, one is harder to deal with. So you're exactly right. So on the fixable one, you can use data to try and make sure that people working from home aren't just overlooked. So one of the two reasons we found why they didn't get promoted as fast as they'd just forgotten about. And so you can use data to try and think more carefully about who's in your promotion pool and consider them, whether or not they're physically in the office that day with you. The other thing was much harder, which is it looked like from c and I've heard this anecdotally as well, that you do develop managerial skills being there in person. So yeah. it's kind of like the flip side of why people are more productive at home. 
because they're not having all those lunches and coffee chats and what seems in the short run maybe to be gossip and in the long run is actually really important to culture building in the firm and you know if I'm in with you every day I have a good sense of what your you know your outside situation is and your thoughts and you know your abilities etc and I probably would be a better manager for you and that's really hard to address because fundamentally if you're working from home you may be great at your current job but you may just you may be even better actually your current job you may perform better than people coming in because you're more focused but you may lose out on some implicitly kind of you know development that means you would work well as a manager one of the companies i work with is remotion which is explicitly trying to enable people to focus on this cultural health and sort of social fabric of organizations problems and it, it's interesting because they've also been um, running and looking at survey data and it's just been a fascinating year in terms of the what leaders are worried about cycling right. very quickly because now I think more and more leaders are recognizing the connectedness and creativity and growth problems are actually the ones that they're going to have to deal with, not the productivity problems. And, you know, we'll, we'll see if the investments work, <laughs> but I think a lot of people are taking the risks now. When I've been advising firms, I've generally said, this is an enormous revolution. So it's easy to go wrong. It's going to continue to churn. So I would be slightly risk averse and kind of, you know, go slowly and learn. It's the exact reverse of go fast and break things. Go slowly and learn from other people's mistakes. So I would probably do it centrally. And the reason to do it centrally is, you know, at the center, you say, say, corporate team, you guys are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, industrial, you guys are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, residential, you guys are, et cetera, because then you can make effective use of office space. And you can also think which teams overlap. So if I think corporate and industrial, I want them in on the same days. I may give them exactly the same three days. And then within the team, everyone sticks to those three days. So that sounds like a very centralized plan, but it is. But it means you can, A, design your overlap and use office space effectively, and B, you don't have this diversity crisis because the opposite is let it's a complete free-for-all. Everyone can choose. Then you can't really shrink the office, and then you have all kinds, you know, there are all kinds of issues that come up with it. I'm not saying that's where we end up, but I would honestly centralize in the short run and then relax out from there because the reverse is really hard, you know. You're opening Pandora's box if you say uh, people can choose if you want to work five days a week and you want to move to Hawaii or Alaska, go ahead. Because, you know, if you discover that's a problem, it's very hard to unwind. it. Yeah. One of the things I think is so interesting right now is in my professional career, I think in everyone's, there's never been a time where there are such divergent attitudes <laughs> about the level of risk people are willing to take on workforce strategy to take advantage of the opportunity. Right. The window of what was normal or what was accepted in terms of workforce strategy was rather narrow, right? Like you were yeah. off in your, your little corner with remote work and everybody was like, oh, that niche thing, right? And I will say like, we have very large companies in the portfolio and por former portfolio that said, the entire office is like, it's, it's a WeWork, right? Hotel in, hotel out. And we're basically remote through our tools and people can choose to do what they wish. And, and so I'd say like, there is a real range. I think people are taking some of the risks you are advising against, but I think those people are really going to need to lean into tools that if you're going to be a very decentralized that way, you are, you're going to need to be technology first, right? And we'll totally see agree. how well that works. It may work out. I mean, look, it's like taking a gamble. The other right. thing to point out that's changed in the last, for me in the last six months, and I mean, the market's even aware of this as in, you know, the, the uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ is it's very obvious now that the labor market's become extremely tight. You've seen, you know, as of today, actually, there are data coming out showing there's the highest number of open job vacancies there's ever been. And this points towards firms having to offer some working from home day perks. In our survey, it turns out people value the ability to work from home two days a week at about 8% of earnings. So if you're trying to fish employees out of a tight labor market and you do not offer working from home two days a week, you know, you decide everyone has to come in five days, but you're going to have to pay at least 8% more to get, hey, it's just become prohibitively expensive. So I suspect tight labor markets are just going to force working from home a couple of days a week onto firms. Otherwise, they're going to have mass quitting and, you know, they're just going to find it impossible to fill position. Yeah. One of the interesting things we've seen is, as you said, I think some leaders recognize choice is going to be challenging to deal with, but they also look at their workforces of highly skilled people who are, you know, they've been given that choice by the pandemic and they say, what do we do, right? Like we need to keep these people. So to some degree, a piece of it is being forced upon us. 
One thing I'd love your point of view on or any learnings you have from the data is like how you think this will impact like different levels of the org. I remember Mark Zuckerberg talking about this in May 2020. It's for new hires. This is a slightly different world. So I would advise new hires coming in more days, maybe not full time. But imagine you're on the 3-2 plan. You may say for new hires, there's going to be one day extra week when it's just you guys and we're going to do training events or you're going to work just basically to socialize you and get you up to speed. So that's one group. And maybe, you know, there are people that are very technically expertise, probably aren't aiming for further promotion within management, can probably easily spend three days a week at home if they're in some technical job. The other thing that's come up a lot in terms of firm organization is what's like to generate a huge increase in outsourcing and offshoring. So the, the number of firms I've talked to that have said, you know what, it's been kind of amazing having these teams working from home for five days a week for a year. It's been really great. You know, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but they've worked really surprisingly well. And I've been thinking, if they work really surprisingly well remote, why don't we move them to, you know, insert country name, India, Mexico, whatever, or outsource them? So in some ways, like, you know, the uh, China in the 2000s, a huge increase of trade from China and, you know, manufacturing offshoring, I think we'll like to see a huge uptick now in services offshoring, in part also because the restrictions on travel and immigration. So... Another sector that I assume, you know, from what I'm hearing anecdotally is kind of exploding is service sector firms that are offering basically outsourcing services, either within the U.S. or abroad. It's interesting. You know, one framework we have for sort of the change in workforce strategy internally is the future of work is more distributed, right? You can describe it as hybrid or, or yeah. remote, but more distributed than it used to be in different structures. And that's very interrelated to it being more global, because if yeah. you're if you're going to be somewhere else, then you might as well get the cost advantage, <laughs> which I think is something that people do not like to talk about in these uh, sort of discussions of, you know, the soft and fuzzies of, of workforce yeah. strategy, right? But there are extraordinary developers and support people and salespeople and many functions elsewhere, right? I think it's also flexible, right? Because yeah, people absolutely. say, if we have to intermediate the work we're doing by scoping it more clearly or communicating through digital tools, then like, you know, it doesn't need to be a full-time employee actually to do this thing. Um, and so I think that the set of changes is actually like quite related. And so when we talk to CEOs about how this is happening, they're like, yeah, well, you know, we're going to do contractors, we're going to do global, and we're going to let people work three, two, right? It's exactly kind of all right. Yeah, exactly right. Offshoring, outsourcing, both of them are just exploding. And the other issue that has come up is it's a lot easier to be multinational because suddenly now we're all much more familiar and eased, uh, you know, ease with Zoom, and video calls. And if you're, you know, imagine the firm has a policy of being at home mostly on Wednesday, Friday. That's the perfect day to have multinational, you know, conversations with the Europe and the US office because it's very straightforward to do it because you're all on a level playing field. So, yeah, I've had, I've had that on many multinational firms have said it's harder to communicate within my office in the US, but it's a lot easier suddenly to communicate. You know, I find it easier to communicate with Portugal now, oddly enough, than I do with, you know, my uh, teammates in the office. That's funny. So Nick, you're a Brit, you, you know, you're running studies in China, you're talking to American and global companies, like, what geographic variation do you think you will, we will see around, you know, these shifts? So I've seen some data, I'm collecting my own data, the best stuff I've seen is partly anecdotal, and partly I saw a paper from the World Bank. So the kind of, you know, the, there's two main things driving this one is just the level of development, it seems kind of obvious, but more developed countries, a have better infrastructure, on broadband, people are richer, they're more likely to have a house that you can work and have space, more likely to have a computer at home. And they're also more likely to do the types of jobs that enable working from home. So maybe it's, you know, once you think about it, it becomes pretty apparent, but the US, for example, has a lot of graduate jobs that work on computers that can be done at home. If you go to, I was talking to a company that has a big subsidiary in Indonesia, so there's a lot of it's more physical manual stuff. You could basically can't do it at home. So one huge angle is development. So as you go from kind of Northern Europe and the US, down to Southern Europe into the developing world, working from home shares goes down because it's just less applicable and harder. The other second angle of this, you know, you, you hear it more anecdotally, it's slightly tough to get data on. I'm trying to collect it is culturally, you know, some Asian countries, particularly Japan, you hear stories about there's a huge importance of FaceTime. And if that's true, I believe that, I don't know if you've, if you've seen it from your portfolio companies at all, that in Asia, the uptake's been lower. Now, one reason, of course, they live in small apartments. The Americans tend to have a lot of space and big houses, but I hear anecdotally cultural factors another reason why it hasn't taken off as much, given what you'd expect by the level of development. 
Yeah, I do think one thing that is a little bit um, sort of understated right now is the degree of cultural change for leaders who have operated in a very different way over a long period of time. Right. Even in our portfolio of people who think of themselves as extreme innovators, and like we do too, there are a lot of people who said, "Well, I'm an office culture guy. I'm an office culture gal, right? I like to right. see, I like to see butts and <laughs> seats." And you know, there's a piece of it, as we were talking about, that is the data would show that culture, creativity, progression, like there are things that we need to enable more differently if it's going to be remote that are not automatically solved by people using, you know, Zoom and Slack and such. But some of it, I think, is going to be just like attitudes in different companies that are going to come from leadership. Um, and some of them may also be like geographic attitudes. Yeah. The other thing, I had a fantastic and fascinating conversation with Marissa Mayer about a year ago now. So I kind of reached out to her to interview her to ask her about what happened in Yahoo in 2013 and what we could learn from it. And it was really interesting. And it's a great parable for the importance of management. So Marissa said, you know, when she took over at Yahoo, they'd been through tremendous upheaval and churn, and they didn't appear to have, you know, the best performance management system in place. So she starts putting this stuff in place, like good performance tracking of individuals. And halfway through this process, she discovers this is a group of people working from home. And some of these people full time working from as in they're permanently at home, but apparently not logged into their computers as an opened up and turned it on for like over a week. So this is not just, you know, low level slacking. This is complete permanent goofing off. And so she you know, basically cancels it and then at some point relaxes back a bit. But the parable of this from talking to her is there's really two ways you can manage people. There's what's called input based management. I sit in the office. And I physically watch you and I check, are you typing away furiously? Do you appear to be productive? Are you kind of asleep or talking to friends? Or there's output management whereby I say, Sarah, I don't care what you do and where you are. If you get your job done, that's great. And if not, you know, you're in trouble. Now, input-based management is horrible at home because you can't watch people. And for firms that relied on it, you can think of it as called basically bad management. But if your input slash bad management working from home is a real challenge. Whereas if you have proper performance-based output management, it's not that difficult. You're never staring, breathing down people's necks in the first place. So from talking to companies, it, it seems that management, particularly performance management, is very complimentary for making this a success. And a lot of the firms are going to beefing up data collection and HR because they're like doing the reverse. They're saying, okay, it wasn't great before the pandemic. It definitely needs to be good now. Let's you know, beef that up. Yeah. And I, I think like there's different ways to do data collection that I think will be effective and not. I'll give you an example of not. I'm sure you've heard of this too. Especially early on in the pandemic, we talked to a number of leaders that basically wanted to see whether or not people's computers were open all the time yes. right? or if people were typing. Right. And perhaps because I have spent too much time in engineering culture, but, you know, it's kind of like engineering metrics. You shouldn't measure lines of code. Right. Because yeah. anything that is even a bad output metric or an input metric that can be gamed by engineers, it will be. Right. No, um, totally. I actually see that surveillance software as remote input management. And it's yeah, I agree. It's, it's not it doesn't work at all. So it's like I can't see that you're working. So I'm going to try and do it remotely. But it was a bad idea from the outset, and it seems creepy now to do it. Remember, I totally agree. So I, that thing has kind of died. I interviewed a surveillance software company back in July last year, and they said oh, business has never been better. And it was very, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty worrying, but I think things have dropped back off. Yeah. I'm sure Marissa's question back at Yahoo uh, during that period of time is like, how did we not notice that these people had no outputs? Or that should have been the, the very first question, right? Yeah, I mean, I... I was totally on board with what she, you know, she basically put in an output performance evaluation system. And once it's up and running, then you can let people work from home, say three days a week, I'm or two days a week. I, you know, I personally, even though I was like the working from home person before the pandemic, was never advocating five days a week. Most people don't even want that. Again, coming back to the earlier discussion, most people want to see their colleagues. It's depressing and isolating. But I think if you're going to work from home two days a week, you just need to be assessed an output. Uh, and then at that point, it works well. What other advice would you have for managers about how to adjust to this? I mean, another thought is on office space that comes up a lot. The, the very obvious things, obviously, sign short run leases because things are extremely uncertain. I have data on lease length, and that's fallen on average from nine to seven years. So everyone's doing it. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Don't sign long leases now. But if you do get a big discount, the second thing is, if you think about the way offices are going to work with hybrid work, the office should now be a place that's really going to have two activities. Most of the time, it's collaborative work. 
So you want a lot of open spaces, meeting rooms, and a bit of the time you may be off in a little cubicle, basically taking a Zoom call, in which case you want tiny cubicles. What you don't want is the old, you know, Mad Men style era of like executive offices, because people aren't really going to be sitting on their own in the office doing individual work, because that's going to be on their home days. So in terms of office design, it actually goes completely contrary to what was there during the pandemic to stop infection spread. It's actually on open plan spaces and collaborative spaces, and you don't want perspex screens and people in cubicles. Then the other comment is, in terms of offices, there's been the net demand for office space in the US is slightly down, not massively. You'd think it would be hugely down because you think, well, look, everyone's going towards working from home. We know in aggregate we're going to go from 5 to 20% of days working from full days work to home. So that's a 15% drop in football into offices. But you have to remember that's being offset by an increase in demand for space, as in reduced density because of fears of contagion. So net net, it's about equal. So what most firms I'm talking to, they're taking having working from home days, they're using that to de-densify the office. So you know, it's mm. not just elevators, it's reception areas and kitchens, et cetera. Turns out the one piece of office space that's kind of cursed is high rises. So if you think of you know skyscrapers, they're like, you know, those things, they're still basically empty because take Salesforce Tower or you know, it's just some huge building in New York. A, to get to the front door, you've got to take the subway. You can't do that in the morning and evening rush hour without being packed in, you know, sardines and so, or the tube in London. And then B, by the time you get to the front door, how do you get up to floor 40 without taking a packed elevator? And elevators tend to be jammed in the way up in the morning and down in the evening. So those buildings are in real trouble. And if I own space in that and I was going to renew a lease, I'd be looking for a massive discount. I mean, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 percent because. In, in, in reverse, in fact, what tech firms often have, these kind of campuses that you can drive or bike to and you can walk upstairs if you want, are actually quite popular. So that's the other twist. It's like it's not that the demand for office space is cratered, it's, it's cratered for high-rise buildings and city centres. Yeah, one thing we've been talking about at Gridlock for the last year is also, you know, if we make these predictions now, what are the second order effects and the third order effects and can we invest in them? We were talking about the donut effect and the impact on, you know, residential real estate as well. Can you explain that? Yeah, so it's very, very clear in the data. So I'm working, in fact, with an undergrad here, quite amazingly, Arjun Romani, and we've been pulled two different sources of data. One is Zillow. So zip code prices by month. And the other is we did a Freedom of Information Act on the U.S. Postal Service and got their change of address data by, for businesses and households by month by zip code. And you see really clearly in both data sets the donut effect. So just to explain it, what's happening is a central business district, the real core downtowns in large cities. So think of New York, Chicago, L.A., D.C., uh, San Francisco, are seeing massive outflows of households and of businesses and price drops. Rental, very obviously, but even you know, resale prices. The suburbs are seeing huge increases. And then places far away, like, I don't know, Topeka, Kansas, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, are going up a bit. So what's happening is the story that kind of ties it all together is people are not leaving U.S. cities. People are not really permanently fleeing New York and San Francisco. What they are doing is moving out to the suburbs. And it makes total sense, because if you're going to work from home two days a week, you can basically commute a bit further, and you also need space for a home office. And so the whole world and businesses, including, is moving out. Now, the economic impact is rental rates are down in city centers and also things like retail traffic. So we estimate New York will probably see in San Francisco a drop of about 10 percent of retail sales in city centers. So, uh, you know, it's not cataclysmic. It's not like we are going to see, you know, back to the 1980s, whereby city centers are dangerous, you know, ruled by crack gangs. Maybe you're going back 10, 15 years. I mean, city centers have been on an upswing since 1980, and maybe their relative price is going to go back to where they were in 2005. So they're still expensive. They're just less so. So I think the market has already done this. But, you know, if you could go back in time, it's pretty obvious you'd want to short city centers and go long in the suburbs. And, you know, already the property markets are doing that. I suspect it may continue a little bit, actually. What's your prediction for, or maybe you're seeing it in the data for, you know, what we'd think of as like secondary cities? And if there's a lot of movement there, they're up a bit, not much. I mean, quite surprisingly. So we broke it into the top 12 cities, which kind of goes from New York to San Francisco. That's one and 12. And then the next up to out to 50. So a place like Kansas City are like, you know, 30. And then the remaining whatever, 300 MSAs. And outside that, they're kind of small towns. So what you see is this donut effect is very heavily driven by the top 12 cities. There's a bit in middle and really not much in the smaller ones. 
there is actually in terms of this is what's kind of interesting in terms of movement of individuals people and businesses they are slightly moving out from big cities not massively a bit so you see a slight exodus but in terms of prices the reverse is going on so you may think that's surprising but i think what's happening in the data is the industries that are heavy in big cities like tech and finance have done really well so the people that work in tech and finance have become dramatically wealthier over the pandemic and afford to buy you know much nicer houses and apartments and that's why they're driving up prices in san francisco and new york but they tend to have lower density so there's probably a lot of lower income people moving out and middle income into you know Tulsa Oklahoma's and etc so you know if you want to have the hottest property market in the entire of the US it will be the suburb of New York and San Francisco those things are going up by like 50 100% Tahoe apparently just now become effectively a <laughs> suburb of San Francisco is up 100% and the worst property markets oddly are the central business districts of the very same cities the reverse was happening for the last 40 years that people were moving into the center and I moved out at speed and since it's about purchase prices it and businesses are permanently moving this thing is not going to entirely snap back some of it will so it's not going to you know permanently stay like this some of it will snap back but certainly 10 years from now city centers will be less expensive and lower density than they would have been without the pandemic so what you are not seeing yet which was a prediction by many earlier in the pandemic is that the sort of second tier of cities massively rising you know companies opening offices in Kansas City and such not really you so you know i talked to probably like you talk to a lot of journalists and they love anecdotal stories about digital nomads but just literally in the data you know given this is tech in the data from the US postal service change of address and zillow pricing data we do not see that so in fact prices are going up fastest overall in the large big cities and there's some very shallow movement out of them but honestly not a lot i think the reason is until big companies leave large cities you know nothing's going to so if you are you know the goliath national bank to take you know that fictional company for how i met your mother or let's think of a real company like google or something you know what you're probably not very tempted to open an office in Tulsa Oklahoma you're probably sticking with silicon valley and the bay area and new york and a few other large metros because that's where a lot of the grads want to be they just now tending to live a bit more out in the suburbs and a bit less in the center and i think you'll see what la is like maybe the development of kind of multipolar cities so you'll see cities where there's a kind of cool area where you know the young single 20 somethings live in a an area where you know 30s go with really nice restaurants and maybe 40s and 50s i don't know the art galleries you know you, you can imagine that we don't all need to cram into the center you can spread out and la has a bit of that there's different parts of the city and that may be what the suburbs turn into because if a lot of people move out with money the suburbs will come more fun you know there'll be more restaurants think of weekday dining it'd be easier to go to downtown palo alto during the, you know a wednesday because there's a lot of people working at home and so there'd be good restaurants I do think that perhaps there is a virtual cycle or like a secular virtuous cycle that hasn't shown up in the data yet considering the compression of how quickly this has happened in that you know as companies enforce or move to a workforce strategy that is aggressively you know more distributed and then invest in the tooling that enables that then they may become more open to new locations as you said that are that are fully remote or just secondary offices possibly You could argue that look if I'm Google say I do care that on the 3 days a week you're in you actually are networking with other people. And if I open an office in Tulsa Oklahoma with 15 people in it and they just network with each other that may end up being completely insular and really unproductive. So in some ways the hybrid puts more emphasis on you really do need to be social and connected on those 3 days a week you're in the office. So they they will be like exhaustingly social Well, you know, by the end of each one of those three days, you'll come home and put a towel on your head and say, "I don't want to talk to anyone for half an hour." You know, I spent all day in meetings, meeting after meeting. But that's the trade-off in return for having the two days of quiet, you know, uh, serene thinking on your working from home days. But that probably won't work if you're disconnected. Another thing I've heard, by the way, is people are talking about you're going to work remotely for four weeks, and you're going to be allowed to live in Alaska and then come in for you know a week where you do. The problem with that plan. is most of these meetings you need for big groups you can't wait for a month so i say say we've got a new you know new product coming out or there's a disaster this needs to fix we all need to get together and huddle as a team you can't say let's do it next month so i think hybrid has to be more or less every other day in the office every other day at home and then it's very easy to shuffle tasks around because most of it is so urgent it can't wait a day right so for that future i painted that 
actually involves more economic opportunity or more jobs in these secondary cities, like companies are really going to have to figure out the networking and the connectivity across offices and with the rest of the organization. That's a tall order. Yeah, I mean, I had the same thoughts. Yeah, I thought early on this would happen. We just are not seeing it in the data. And we have data up to, you know, March 2021. So it could still happen. I don't want to rule it out. But, you know, so far, and we're a year into the pandemic. You know, final thought that's kind of interesting. Another long run trend is the technology around working from home is dramatically improving. So I have data from the US Patent and Trademark Office, and we've um, been looking at and scraping the number of times the word working from home comes up or remote work or video calls in patents. And you see it's about 1% before the pandemic. And then it suddenly just starts to explode from March 2020 onwards. So there's clearly a massive charge of people into innovating around working from home technology, which means what we're experiencing now will clearly get better. So if you look back 20 years, things like, you know, Skype in 2002 was a huge step forward. So you have video calls over the internet and then Dropbox and you know, cloud around 2010, so you could file share. Those kind of massive innovations, I think we're going to see more of them. So who knows what it will be? You know, if I knew I'd be investing, as I guess with all of us, but five, 10 years from now, almost certainly some fantastic new working from home tech is going to come out because companies, I know they're for, I mean, the market for working from tech has gone up four or five X. So of course the R&D dollars pouring into that and the startup funding has exploded. So that's exciting, but it also means this thing is only really like to go in one direction. I think we're going to get better at it. And so that's another force pushing us towards continued working from home. Yeah. You know, Nick, we don't know and we are investing in it, right? But it's certainly something that we believe in just because uh, people want the choice and the potential economic benefits and social benefits are very high. But, you know, it, it will not be trivial. You've obviously been thinking about this area for a long time, but you also have such a good nose for data as to how we can actually understand what's happening and, you know, be factful in our understanding of it. What research of yours should we look out for or what what else are you interested in understanding in the coming months? Oh, uh, well, that, you know, e- economists are data nerds. I know there's an entire field called data science, but it, it's kind of, you know, econ and data science are more or less one and the same. I'm just continuing to collect data on how this thing unwinds, actually. Not long after the beginning of the pandemic, uh, with Jose Barrera and Steve Davis, we started up a survey of initially two and a half thousand, now 5,000 Americans per month, just to collect data. And we have another survey of firms with Atlanta Fed. They're just really interesting seeing how, you know, you can see people charging home, you can see them slowly unwinding. A lot of the stuff from that that's fascinating is on views on people's, say, on social distancing. So one question that I, when I give talks, I often, I use, you know, the polling feature in Zoom, that I think is almost a new innovation. I ask people the same question we ask these in massive surveys. You always get the same answer, which is post-COVID, after you've had the vaccine, what's your behavior going to be? And there's a kind of scale where the highest score is completely returned to pre-activities and the lowest is continued social distancing. You can reverse. It doesn't matter what's highest or lowest, but there's the kind of two ends of the spectrum. And what you find is over three quarters of people say they won't fully return. And they say they're going to avoid subways and crowded elevators because they're just, they've seen too many sneeze videos. I mean, honestly, they're too terrified. And so that kind of stuff is, you know, striking. That's true. That has huge implications for, you know, New York, London. You know, I used to commute every day to the Welcome Back in London on the Tube. And according to that data, most people will be too nervous to get on a crowded Tube train. If you travel on the Tube in Russia, you know that, you know, your face is like pushed against the glass half the time. It's so packed. And it's clear that one person sneezing, everyone catches whatever. And you used to accept it, but There are some pretty um, interesting things to watch. I don't know how much that will carry out, but that could be another massive impact of the pandemic is the distaste for density that makes certain activities really hard to carry out. And I think that's big business implications as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Nick. Super fun. And we'll just keep uh, watching the world as this unfolds. Great. Hey, lovely to talk as always, sir. That concludes this episode of Gray Matter. If you enjoyed listening to this conversation and want to hear others like it, please subscribe to Gray Matter on SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find new episodes and blogs on our website, graylock.com. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at graylockvc. Thanks for listening.